Thank you, Ken, and welcome, everybody. Um, what I would like to do is I would like to take a fairly quick run through some of the things that are changing our world in ways that most people don't anticipate. Uh, I'm going to try to leave plenty of time for questions because either you will be totally disgusted, uh, which is usually the, the reaction of my students, uh, or you will have questions which I will try to avoid answering because they will be difficult questions. <laughs> so what I would like to do is I would like to start by looking at a couple of framing quotations. The first one is from Stuart Brand, who most of you recognize uh, as the originator of the Whole Earth Catalog. We are as gods, and we might as well get good at it. I give this to you for your consideration for two reasons. The first is Stuart Brand was clearly one of the leaders of the environmental movement. And you'll notice that the first thing he's doing in this statement is taking responsibility for the world. He's not saying, you go out and sell your SUV. He's not saying, we need to do this. He's not saying hair shirts. He's saying, you know what? We are as gods. Get used to it. Get over it. It's your world. The second thing is, it's a fairly optimistic statement. It's ironic to me that back in the 1960s, when all heck was breaking loose, he could be optimistic, and here we are in one of the better off countries of the world, if not the best off country in the world, and all we can sum up is a cynical pessimism. The second comes from uh, Bill Gibson, William Gibson, who's a science fiction writer. The future is already here, it's just unevenly distributed. I run into this all the time in my discussions. The problem we have got is that technology is bubbling up in ways that people generally don't see unless they're part of the subgroup that's working with it. Uh, for example, I do a lot of talks to uh, people in Scottsdale, Arizona. Um, and I tell them that their children at Arizona State University and elsewhere are consuming substantial amounts of cognitive pharma off-label cognitive pharma, which helps them take tests, concentrate, uh, and that sort of thing. Uh, most of them refuse to believe it. Most of them don't think the pharma is out there, don't think their kids would ever take it, uh, and don't see the purpose of it anyway. <coughs> Very different communities. Clearly, cognitive pharma is already embedded in American society. Just as clearly, unless you're part of that group, you don't understand that. So the tricky thing about some of the technologies I'll talk about is you've got to be looking in a lot of different directions. And finally, for those of you that are of a um, um, classical persuasion, now I am become death, destroyer of worlds. What I like about this one is the first time it was said, it was said by a legitimate god, Vishnu. The second time, it was Oppenheimer as he was watching the first nuclear explosion. In all of our discussion of global climate change and problems with the nitrogen cycle, uh, it's important to realize that we have already gotten to the point where it is well within our capability to destroy this world through technological means. And this remains within our capability and all of the other things you're worrying about pale next to this possibility. If you want to talk to me about climate change, we can talk about climate change. But it is not as big a threat, an existential threat, as nuclear weapons were. Moreover, if you have any doubts about Stuart Brand, you can go back to this. Because this is when the human species changed forever and fundamentally. OK, so more good news. Um, <laughs> This is from Heidegger. And the reason I like this one, well, there's a couple of reasons. The first is, it amuses me uh, to have an engineer start a talk with a quote from Heidegger. The second is that if you know Heidegger, he's a German metaphysician. These are probably the only two sentences he ever wrote that make sense without the use of powerful cognitive enhancements, which are illegal in most states. <laughs> and the third, uh, and probably the least important reason I use it is that, in fact, he's right. Particularly the last part. 
The flight into tradition out of a combination of humility and presumption can bring about nothing in itself other than self-deception and blindness in relation to the historical moment. We have every incentive to deceive ourselves and to be blind to what we have wrought. And the reason is that to take responsibility for it, given what we know, given what we are already doing, uh, to most people seems to be far too much to assume. The alternative, which is to ignore what it is we have already created, what we have already wrought, is where we tend to go. I would suggest that that is increasingly unethical. As you realize, as you look out the window and you see, you don't look out the window and see wilderness. You couldn't see wilderness if you tried because there is no wilderness left. Everything out there has to some extent been engineered by humans. It's a terraformed planet. You can like it, you can not like it, but the fact is that unless you accept it and begin to try to deal with it as best you can, you are, I would argue, falling into the trap that our German metaphysician friend suggests. So I'm going to go through a couple of trends. This is going to be really quickly. What I want to do is try to frame the ensuing discussion uh, when all of you will be appointed to high office. Too bad for you. <laughs> the first is, welcome to the Anthropocene, to the human Earth. Scientists are calling it the Anthropocene. Uh, you can argue about it. You can talk about the extent. But the fact is that by any reasonable metric, you live on a terraformed planet. If you were an alien, well, maybe at this point it's better, you might believe it more if I said, if I were an alien. So I'm an alien, I'm in my spacecraft, and I fly around this particular piece of rock. And what do I see? The first thing I see is that the signature, the electronic signature that you leave across the cosmos has been fundamentally altered by the fact that you're on it. Your planet glows at night in ways that it was not designed to do naturally. Technology is a critical locus of accelerating evolutionary pressures. Um, that's more important for those of you uh, that grow up in the social sciences and believe that uh, technology uh, really isn't that important. Um, the world is becoming more complex and information dense. This is a really critical thing. You want to know what's changed between when I went to school and when the kids today go to school. What's changed is, if I wanted to know anything, I had to go into a library, look it up in a card file, and then make it up in my term paper. <laughs> what they do now is, they go on Google. They have the entire corpus of Western history available to them. What does that mean? How does that change your cognition? Nobody knows. I guarantee the professors don't know. All right. Sustainability is becoming a powerful mythology. By that, I mean that, uh, for example, in engineering, we're getting enormous pressure to do sustainable engineering. When you go back and you try to find out what that is so that you can figure out how to do it, nobody knows. But it is a social myth. And I would argue that it is, and, and by that, I don't mean to be pejorative. What sustainability is trying to do is it's trying to give you a framework to think about a world that has already gotten so complex and scary that you don't have established, reasonable ways to think about it. So it becomes a myth. It becomes a comfortable myth. All we need to do is do sustainability. Well, you can talk about unicorns, too. That doesn't mean it's true. So if you really are serious about this, and I think 95% of the people that talk about this are not serious about it, then you need to do some very deep thinking about the world you've already got. Technological evolution will become discontinuous. We will not know, we do not know how to manage the technologies we have now. The current fight over copyright, what does that represent? That represents an argument over whether you're going to protect information because you don't have enough of it, or whether you're going to free up information to do new creative things at the meta level because you realize you've already got too much information. Foundational values and cultural values become contingent. Now, this is important because if you think about it, culture is an information process. If I accelerate the flow of culture, of, of information rather, and if I create much more of it, what I have done is I have significantly destabilized culture in ways that most people are not going to realize because culture to them is the sea they swim in. They don't see it, they don't understand it, and they will not understand how bad it's been perturbed. Um, Think about, for example, natural supernatural. 150 years ago, 
If you were talking about what the opposite of natural is, it was what you would expect. It was spooks, it was devils, it was demons, it was you know, all kinds of good stuff, um, most of which apparently lived in California, still do. <laughs> now, when you buy a natural cereal, what are you buying? You're buying a cereal that is least touched by human hands. When you buy natural food, what are you buying? You're buying food that hasn't been distorted, destroyed, dragged down by human technology. So the opposite of, of, of natural now is not supernatural, it's the human. Now think about that. Just at the time in the history of our species when we're growing to dominate a planet, we begin to redefine our terms in such a way as to pretend we're not. It's a very interesting psychological phenomenon. Yeah, fundamentalism versus modernity, you got that part, just read the papers. Um, terrorism and national security driving uh, technology. This is a very important point. A lot of times when you talk about some of the technology systems we'll talk about, the response most people have is, well, just stop doing it. Um, there was a, a group in Canada, a large um, NGO, non-governmental organization, that said we should just stop doing nano. This was at a time when virtually all electronics was operating at a scale below that considered to be nano. Uh, there's been a call very recently that we stop doing synthetic biology. The fact that there's a lot of people in this country and around the world doing synthetic biology in their garages uh, means that that's probably going to be just as successful as the call not to do nano. The role of the nation state is changing profoundly. It doesn't mean the nation state is going to go away, but it means the govern governance structures that apply to things like the technologies we'll talk about are very different. It also means that when I appoint you to your high office, you're going to have to realize that your client is not just the United States, that your client is, is scattered in many different ways in organizations all around the world. The new great game, um, the way I pose this to my students is, uh, 150 years ago, you had British guns, gunships sailing up the Yangtze. Who's going to be sailing up the Potomac 150 years from now? Um, and some of the brighter ones say that nobody, because we will have drained the Potomac. Um, <laughs> but I usually don't give them too much credit, because that's a cop out. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. OK, so some of the key concepts that you need to be thinking about. Earth systems. Most of us, particularly those who have been traditionally trained, think about Earth systems as things like the natural cycles, the hydrologic cycle, phosphorus, sulfur, nitrogen, carbon. Um, but if you look at the world as it is out there, what you rapidly realize is that the economic, uh, the cultural, the social structures that we have built, the institutions we have built, are having just as much effect on the world. Why are we worried about biodiversity? Is it because we think that as an Earth system it has somehow gotten out of kilter? No, it's because of the way we affect evolved biodiversity. Focus on systems. Um, Mutually exclusive but equally valid ontologies. Um, that sounds really fancy. It sounds like I've been reading too much Heidegger and or consuming too much of the material we talked about earlier um, that I would certainly not mention on camera. What that does mean is that if you have a coherent worldview, it is necessarily at best partial and arbitrary. That the world is so complex that no single individual or group of individuals with a similar belief system can understand it. Now you can view that as being very scary or you can view it as an opportunity because we need to understand it. Now think about how you would do that. And if your answer is the United Nations, we should talk. The world is design space. Why are we worried about climate change at all? We're worried about climate change because humans are beginning to design the atmosphere. And your response to that, quite rightly, is garbage. Nobody ever asked me about designing the atmosphere. Well, nobody ever said that you, the individual, were the operative level for that kind of impact at this point anyway. Clearly, the species as a whole is dramatically changing the way the climate behaves. Clearly, the same thing is happening to nitrogen, to phosphorus, and Biology. But biology is not nearly the clear story that you, that you think it is. Most people think about 
clearly there is a biodiversity crisis, we need to do something. The contrary argument is, no, there is not. That what you have is a cusp, and the cusp is between evolved biodiversity and designed biodiversity. That there is as much information being packed into new forms of life now by people at MIT and other strange places as there is uh, in the evolutionary structure that we're losing. So you're not losing biological information, but it is skewing and being engaged in different systems. Does that matter? Yes, it matters. A traditional and evolved biological system tends to evolve to be stable. That's what it likes to be. A design system usually is designed for maximum throughput because we design it for uh, economic reasons. That's a huge difference. What that implies is a biology that is increasingly based on synthetic biology will be less stable than a biology based on evolved biodiversity. But you don't even get to think about that until you realize what's actually going on in the world that we've created. The human is design space. Take a minute and think quietly now about anything about the human as you know it that you don't want changed. And then realize that somewhere, somebody like me is figuring out how to change it. How are you going to design the human? Everything you think you know is in play. Everything you are is in play. And that's, that's not going to stop. It may stop in the United States. It may stop in Europe. It will not stop in some of our competitors. Because if, for example, I can create an individual with only a few percent better cognition on a regular basis, I will have designed a culture that, all else equal, will grow to dominate the world. Which is why I decided I'd better promote you. <laughs> Madam and Mr. Secretary, congratulations. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go through some of these issues from the perspective of the Secretary of Defense. Because if you keep talking in these platitudes, it gets kind of difficult to, to interpret. I want to start by giving you your first briefing. And the first briefing is going to touch on some of the things that you need to think about to help protect this country. Because you are now the Secretary of Defense. The first thing you need to think about is what your new constraints are. One of the major constraints is that you, as the Secretary of Defense for a hegemonic power, that's us, you need to be able to project power anywhere I tell you. I promoted you to Secretary of Defense. I naturally become the Commander in Chief. Um, I kind of like the way that works. <laughs> but you've got to do it without casualties, right? This is a major change. World War I. We could lose 60, 70, 80,000 people a day per side, and people would turn around and do it again the week after. Today, we lose five people in a day, and it's headline news. You need to figure out how to manage casualties, because if you don't, what you're going to do is lose your ability to manage your military uh, mission. Not because you can't do it, but because the public support that you need is going to diminish. So you need to cut casualties. This, in turn, drives some obvious technologies. Think about, for example, um, uh, lethal autonomous robots. Why would you do that? It scares people. They don't like the idea. Well, you do that. Because if it's the robot that's out there being lethal, it's the robot that gets killed. It's not uh, a soldier. It's not a warrior. So it drives technology in certain directions. It's not the only driver. Uh, computer brain interfaces that tie you directly to weapon systems. Why would I do this? Why would I want to have you be like the Duke monkey, where the monkey is sitting in, in a, uh, a lab at Duke and is running a robot in Japan. Why do I want to do that? I want to do that because I can put you in Duke. Never be a monkey at Duke. If you don't get anything else out of this conversation, <laughs> never be a monkey at Duke. 
I can put you at Duke, and then whatever it is you're operating is in the combat zone, and I can protect you from being destroyed. You also need to get greater efficiency. Not in the immediate, but think about the problem the military faces. Those of you that, that work for companies, um, those of you that have recently left companies, when the boomers retire, there is going to be a huge gap in our ability to support particularly technology-rich areas. That's already happening. Uh, you're the military. You're going to be competing with people like IBM, Hewlett Packard. You can't pay as much. Um, your uniform looks cooler. Uh, but you're liable to get killed. I mean, it's like you have no benefits in this contest. So what do you want to do? You want to be able to continue your mission, but you need to do it by substituting capital for labor. This has happened virtually across the board. Adam Smith, Pin Factory, what did he do? He said, you got to differentiate blue collar labor if you're going to run an efficient manufacturing operation. Railroads, an incredibly complex corporate structure. What is that force? That forces you to differentiate white collar labor. It's not enough that you're the factory manager in, in factory capitalism in 1780s uh, UK and you do everything yourself. Now you have to differentiate white collar labor. What's the obvious place for differentiation that we haven't tapped yet? The obvious place is to differentiate humans, to create different human varietals. Now, lest you think that this is all a fantasy, how many people here have been vaccinated? Mm-hmm. For anything. So what I've done is I have taken an engineered device and I have put it inside you for the explicit purpose of changing the way your immune system reacts to the natural world. And in doing so, I have built part of you so that now, looking out here, your average life expectancy will be somewhere around 80, 85, 90, 75. Zimbabwe, 20 with a good car. Zimbabwe. Most of Africa, most of Central America, you're probably looking at somewhere between 45 and 55. You're already a human varietal. You've already been engineered to live longer than natural human beings. So of course it's possible. You already are. Moreover, if I take an fMRI of my son and I compare it with an fMRI of me trying to multitask, for example, what I will immediately find is that my son is hardwired differently in his brain than I am. Because he grew up with these technologies, his brain is extremely plastic, and it's able to integrate with the technology structure around it. I integrated with mine. What was mine? It was a library with a bunch of cards. He integrated with his. I can never, well, at the edges, at the edge of the bell curves, I may be able to compete with the really, really bad digital natives really bad. But for the most part, they're always going to be better because they're hardwired. We've already got human varietals. We don't like to think about it, but that's what we have. All right, what else you got to worry about? Security and radical contingency of military and security domains. Complexity. The problem here is, what is it I need to be worried about? You guys are the Secretary of Defense. You tell me what technology is going to come down the pike that I need to worry about 10, 20 years from now. <clears throat> you have no idea. Your best scientists don't know. This is a really, really scary world if you want to seriously manage technology. AT&T, one of the brightest companies in, in the country at the time, before I left, <laughs> It went essentially bankrupt. Why did it go bankrupt? Because they were used to telephone technology, telephone switching technology. Internet protocol telephony came along. AT&T was unable to adapt, and it died. It got bought by SBC. SBC kept the trademark because they liked the trademark and they liked the funny little globe. AT&T is gone. It's history. 
And that's what technological change will do to you. And if anybody was going to keep track of technological change, you would have thought it was Bell Labs. Oh, no. They were going out to lunch at Murray Hill or something. Everybody in the game knows that cultural competition is going to hinge on your technological capability. Not now, maybe. Not 10 years, 20 years. The United States clearly has an advantage. But somewhere, it's going to depend on our technological capability. This is not a low stakes game. This is a serious high stakes game. Human consciousness is the low bandwidth component. Let's start thinking about the human aspect. What is, what is the reason that we're doing augmented cognition in combat situations, in modern cars? It's because human bandwidth is inadequate to the task that we're trying to assign it. I can build technology systems that have far more throughput, react far better, far quicker than humans do. And yet somehow I've got to keep humans in the loop. All right, well, I'll try. But what does that do? What this tells you is that you're going to be developing systems where the cognition from the systems, the emergent behavior of the systems, is not dependent on the humans. Every one of us has been taught to think like a Cartesian. And if you didn't read it in school in some stupid philosophy book, you got it because you watched The Matrix. You're all a Cartesian. But that's not the case. That's not where the thinking occurs. That's not where the cognition emerges. I'm not talking about consciousness. I don't want to talk about consciousness. I'm talking about the cognition of the system. Where are the changes that are manipulating our world occurring? Not out of any individual, but out of systems that are too complex for any single individual to understand. Aut autonomous cars, why do we do that? Well, we do that for an obvious reason, right? If I'm GM, I realize that many of my customers are getting old. I realize that at least if they're anything like me, they're starting to, to lose cognitive ability at the corners. I still want to sell me cars. How do I do that? I put the cognition in the car. So if GM is smart, by the time I totally lose it, they're going to have built a car that can still drive me and then I can still buy. And my kids are all going to be texting anyway, so <laughs> it's probably a good idea. Now, remember, you are the um, Secretary of Defense. Here's the kinds of things you have to worry about. It is not just technology that is changing. So for example, I come up with a really nice heat ray. Penetrates about a 64th of an inch under the skin. Um, very, very cool for uh, crowd control. We sent it to Afghanistan to deploy it. Um, and then somebody said, oh my god, this is a heat ray. I read a science fiction book about that. And the, the uh, uh, responsible commander sent it back, which was too bad because it was a really good weapon. Is it a really good combat weapon? No. It's a really good policing weapon. Why are we worried about policing weapons? Why is that driving our technological evolution? Why should you, Madam and Mr. Secretary, care about policing weapons? Because your mission has changed. You think you're doing combat, but you got to do combat. You got to do policing. You got to do search and rescue. You got to help kids in kindergarten. Holy moly, how do you train a troop to do that? Those are very, very different kinds of missions. Revolutions in military operations and culture. Some of you are undoubtedly ex-Air Force. Some of you are pilots. I had a friend who went to Pensacola. She was going to be a Navy pilot. She was going to fly off aircraft carriers. And the Navy figured out that they're probably going to be using drones to do that. They don't need pilots anymore. Now, the entire hierarchy of the Air Force is pilots. How are the pilots reacting to the fact that some pimply 17-year-old from high school who can't pass anything but can play World of Warcraft like a champ is coming in and taking over their UAV operations? Serious culture issues. And again, I'm presenting it in an um, argumentative way. But think about what that means. 
where is the where is the the military culture in the Air Force? It's embedded in the leadership in the hierarchy. Why does the U.S. military, all things considered, behave as one of the most ethical militaries that history has ever known? Because of the culture. You start putting kids in there, and what's going to happen to that culture? What's going to change? Now, you can manage it, but you can only manage it if you're willing to understand the profound nature of the change that you're talking about. So um, there will be a test on this. <laughs> I realize you can't read it. Um, that's probably just as well. Um, what this essentially does is it looks at what you need to think about as the Secretary of Defense if you want to manage all of these areas. Revolutions in military operations and culture. Revolutions in civilian systems. It used to be that the state was dominant. Now if we don't like what a state's doing to its own citizens, we go in there and we're rewriting the laws of war to make that okay. Revolution in military technologies, um, that's what we've been talking about, and revolutions in nature of conflict. The problem is, it is all changing underneath you. It used to be that one of these would change at a time. You want a battleship? I'll give you a battleship. But all this stuff is going to be good. You can get your dreadnought. It's all great. We'll go to war in 1918. Not a problem. But now it's all changing. Everything you think you know is at best contingent. What are you going to tell me to do? Mr. President, I resign. <laughs> I want to finish by looking at the human, OK? And I want to think about some of the things that are going on partially with uh, DOD or DARPA support. Um, victory over mortality. A lot of life extension technologies have at least uh, some DARPA support. Obviously, there's some that's not uh, involved with DARPA. Why are we doing that? Think about all the implications if all of us suddenly begin to live for essentially uh, unlimited lifespans. Think about what that does to reproductive policy. Forget about your 401k. That, you know, <laughs> that's trivial. Think about what it does to the world. Think about what it does when I stay in my job for 50 or 60 or 70 years. Where are all those kids going to go? Well, if they're smart, they'll go after me with a knife in an alley. But you know, let's hope not. Why do you want to do this? You want to do this. Go back to what's driving this. You want to do this because the creation of human varietals that are optimized for combat situations could be a very, very critical technology to managing national power. If you do that, what are the implications? If I build you so that you can operate for 30 or 40 years at peak efficiency like a 20-year-old, I guarantee you that's important from a military perspective. I also guarantee you that that's going to cause all kinds of problems. Cognition. Uh, we've talked a little bit about cognition. The thing, to, the thing to think about here is how we create network cognition at the scale of the battlefield. So if I had time, I would show you cute little YouTube um, videos of mechanical hummingbirds, little robot hummingbirds. They're really cute. They fly nicely. They can fly indoors and outdoors. Um, I can, of course, equip them not just with surveillance packages, but ricin packages so that they can kill anybody that I designate. You have a network of these things. This is your battlefield. This is one robotic system. And it's coupled into your brain. What do you do with that? I don't know. Drugs. The drugs we have now that, for example, my students are using. Those drugs were not designed for the use they're putting them to. But they're using them anyway because, unfortunately, they work. Now we're developing drugs that are specifically targeted at certain mental functions. Drugs that will take away your sense of risk. Drugs that will help me manipulate your memory. These things are all coming down the pipeline. Why am I doing this? I am doing this for military reasons, and I'm doing it because I know, given my sales of uh, anti-ADD drugs, that if I develop a really cool drug for the military, there's going to be an awful lot of off-label use. MRIs, talked about that. Monkey with brain implants, we've talked about that. Um, these things, a lot of these things are being developed for very important medical applications. 
okay, particularly given some of the individuals we have coming back from Afghanistan and Iraq, um, AFPAC. But everything that I develop for a medical purpose, I can probably use in another way to enhance. Because enhancement is simply moving people up, whether it's from normal up or whether it's from um, uh, problematic uh, towards normal. Telepathic helmets. This technology is one, uh, it's already been worked on at places like Berkeley, Carnegie Mellon. What I do is I put a helmet on you, it uh, works with your brain, and eventually I can understand the nouns that you're thinking of. So what I do is I put helmets on all members of my team and they can think at each other rather than have to, in the middle of a very covert operation, yell at each other, uh, which is kind of tacky. <laughs> but think about what telepathic helmets will do. If I can put a telepathic helmet on a soldier and that soldier can communicate what they're thinking, then why can't I determine what you're thinking without putting a telepathic helmet on you? And if I can do that, what happens to your privacy? Now your privacy is shot anyway, right? Anybody that thinks they still have privacy left is, is banking on the fact that they're too unimportant for anybody to give a darn, which is kind of dicey. But think about it now. All of you have three lives. You got the life you live where you kind of show up at a place like this, you're dressed, everything's cool. Then you got your private life where you're at home and you know dancing on tables, but it's your business. And then you've got the life that goes on only inside your brain. And that would send every one of you to jail. <laughs> and I'm going to be able to pull that out. Now let's assume that I'm mature enough so that I understand that what people really think can't be used against them the way a picture on Facebook can. Even then, how have I changed human relations? How much of culture depends on the little myths that we've built up that are different than that which we are deep in our own uh, psychologies? Um, I leave that to you as a... Homework. So what I want to finish up with is I want you to think seriously as the secretaries of defense. Some of the enhancement issues from a purely military perspective, and I do this not because the military perspective is the only one that matters. That clearly is not the case. I do this because it helps focus some of the issues in a real world situation. So let's say that I'm developing all of these different ways of enhancing humans. How safe do they have to be before I introduce them? Most of you know that we used vaccines that hadn't been fully tested uh, before uh, some of our recent military conflicts and that they did have impacts on some individuals. How, are the, how is the self-perception and self-image of war fighters changed if I am enhancing them for various aspects of military operations? Do they, for example, begin to think of themselves as separate and better from unenhanced people? To the extent we have data, from people who enhance themselves. There's people, a guy in Australia who, for example, injects RFIDs on his, in, under his skin so that he can manipulate his environment. And, everything. and his observation is, it doesn't take very long at all before you begin to realize how stupid people are because they can't do the same thing you can do. Um, how does it affect teammates' perceptions? Can you team with somebody who is enhanced in a very different way than you are? Can human varietals work together in ways that, um, that reflect their uh, integrated skills uh, as opposed to conflict. Should officers, must officers, be more enhanced than enlisted men? Most of you know we do this uh, in the military now anyway. Officers go through at least airborne, usually airborne ranger um, in the army. Most enlisted men don't unless they're called on to do those specific skills. So we enhance the officers. Are we going to continue to do that? And if these enhancements are permanent, does that amount to creating a permanently um, um, uh, enhanced class? Are there ethical limits? Uh, can you, for example, legitimately introduce euphoria, fearlessness, or amnesia? Can I take a, you come back from a mission, it's been a terrible mission, you say, boy, I saw things I never, ever want to see again, and I take away your memory. Can I do that? Should I do that? How does it affect my behavior on the battlefield knowing that that can be done? What risks do they create for third parties? If I 
uh, unleash you, uh, take away your sense of risk, what does that do for civilians that may be in the environment? Are the enhancements reversible? Obviously, better if they're reversible. But suppose they're not. We've genetically engineered mice to see colors that no mouse ever saw before. And they can do it, and we know they can do it because we've tested the mice. Can I genetically engineer you so that you can see in the infrared? I, you lose, right? You lose glasses, the battery goes out, that's just real. No, I'll just genetically engineer you. And you can see in the infrared. Is that OK? Is that legitimate? Can I return you to civilian life? Does there come a point when I have enhanced you in such a way that returning you to civilian life becomes uh, impossible? Can I create a permanent warrior class? And if I do, <laughs> how stable is the world for the rest of us? If, if we do do that, my suggestion is you stay as Secretary of Defense. It might be a good place to be. Should you use the ability to remain enhanced as a recruiting device? Suppose that I figure out, and as some of you know, there's, there's at least a couple of things, including C60, which just popped up in the news a couple of days ago, where we're looking at ways to extend life fairly significantly. Suppose I can do that, and I enhance you so that you have an extended life. Should I use that as a recruiting device? Yeah, you want to join special ops? Great. I'll give you 40 years of extra life. Now, 25% you're going to buy the farm, but you figure it out. Do I require a lengthening of service? What about if it's a conscript? Most of the time, your ability to demand that a draftee do something is less than your ability to demand that a volunteer do something, both ethically uh, and sometimes legally. So are we locking ourselves out of a draft if we become dependent on an enhanced warrior population? Questions? You keep referring to the word ethics in here from time to time. Do ethics evolve also? Or do we still go back to Socrates and deal with the same veritas? Um, the ethics, I think, evolves. But it's not a linear process, and it's not a process where all ethics evolve. There's some patterns of behavior that seem to be fairly common uh, in many cultures. And there's some that are not. Ethics is a very tricky area. So for example, let's say that, that, um, let's say that I die, and I'm in our culture, and my kids uh, cremate me and do something nice with the ashes, oh, yeah, whatever. Kids are doing the ashes. Let's say that I die in another culture and my kids, to show their uh, loyalty and love, eat my brain. Our tendency is to think that the people who eat the brain are barbarians. Their tendency is to look at us and see the way that my kids just throw me into this machine and burn me and to think that that's incredibly unethical. Both of us are following, however, the more fundamental ethical precept of you've got to honor the dead. I think ethics does change. Um, if you look at, for example, the way that the Spanish treated the uh, Native American populations when they first came over, uh, clearly they treated them as if they were not people. They were not people in the full ethical sense. We've changed that. Uh, slavery still exists, but virtually everybody knows it's wrong. So I think ethics does evolve. But how it evolves is very tricky. Moreover, if I start engineering people in different ways, it's liable to affect the ethical function, part of which is biological. So at that point, I think it becomes a very open question. It's a difficult question. And it's certainly one that I would keep in mind. But I don't think there's a good answer to it a priori. 
Yes, ma'am. Um, so you've talked about us uh, interacting with all this technology. At what point do we become unnecessary? I don't think we ever become unnecessary. I think what happens is that we integrate with the technology that's around us. Um, how many people here remember the beginning of 2001? OK, so for those of you that don't, what happens is there's a big monolith. It just appears. I'm an ape. I start hugging and kissing the monolith for reasons which completely escape me. And then I go out. There's a pile of bones. And I pick up a bone. And at first, I'm just an ape with a bone. And then I realize it's a weapon. And I strike. An ape with a weapon is a very different animal than an ape holding a bone. It is a different entity. It has integrated the technology with itself and its psychology in such a way that it has created something new. My son is wired for the digital structures around him. He's new. That's a different kind of human being than we have ever had before, because the technology is different. Now, in the West, we tend to be fairly skittish about this. So you watch The Matrix, right? And The Matrix is all about the Cartesian individual against this evil technology, right? Neo, the great guy, goes out, takes uh, two pills. The only problem is nobody tells him there's like five more in the medicine cabinet, and they're all different colors, and he could have a really, really wild life. So he picks the two pills, and he takes them. And it's him against the technology, and the real people against the technology. It's a Frankenstein myth. You go to the Japanese media, things like Ghost in the Shell, which some of you may have seen. And what you find is it's much more comfortable for the Japanese to conceptualize humans integrating with technology. At the end of, at the end of one of those, those films, the human being and the internet have become integrated into a person, an agent of both. The observation is we tend to fight technology conceptually, but in practice, I think we integrate with it. So what this means is I don't think we will go away. But the other side of that question is I'm not sure what we is going to be, because we're going to be an integrated function. And in some ways, we always have been. So one and then two. Let me do that. Um, Checks and balances, picking up on the ethical question, things of that nature, and whether or not we are sustainable and does anybody care. Where are the checks and balances? We have scientists who are concerned about their things being misused. Where is it going to go now if we become part of a machine? Are we part of the corporate image where it's just bottom line or are other things such as justice and ethics and equity, are they still going to be viable? Well, I think yes. Um, I, think that, I think that the difficulty with a lot of these systems is that they are big enough and potent enough and the powers behind them are strong enough so that our ability to manage them is attenuated. And this raises a serious problem. Let's think about. Um, Think about stem cells. Uh, a lot of people in the United States had ethical problems with stem cells, at least in some of the variants. Uh, so we implemented a policy where federal funding would no longer be provided to individuals who used more than a limited number of stem cell lines. The effect was to drive many researchers to places like Singapore that welcomed them in for working broadly with stem cells and create places like California, as always, where people started doing stem cell work under the state. So we didn't stop that technology. Uh, similarly, the, uh, the Europeans with GMOs. The Europeans have been very, very adamant about not liking genetically modified agricultural organisms. And yet the technology is one of the most rapidly uh, adopted in history. Places like Australia, Canada, the United States, Brazil. So what you have, I think, is a situation where some of these technology systems are very powerful and our ability certainly to stop them, probably to manage them, is limited. 
We don't know how limited it is because by and large, we have an extraordinary failure of imagination. We have failed to understand the world that we have already created. And in doing so, we have never tried to honestly manage them. What we have done is we have, we have become sort of play actors to keep ourselves happy as opposed to taking ethical responsibility for the world. And I think, I think that's unacceptable. But I think that's where we are. So they don't go away. Justice, equity, they those are still very important. They have, to be active. they have to be active and they have to be honest. I mean, if I assume a world of a million people, I can give you sustainability. Everybody gets 40 acres, a trout farm, and a place in Vermont, you know, and we're all happy. And in Florida. And we're all happy. But I got a, I got a planet with nine billion, working towards nine billion people, and they all want a better life. A lot of the things we talk about are fantasy when you look at that single reality. So we are refusing to take ethical responsibility. It's not a question of we can't do it. It's a question of we never tried. Um, you know, technology's moving at, like you said, an exponential rate, you know, and um, with the advances of augmented reality and stuff, you know, it's just going to be kind of an appendage to people. So do you think that people will ever get to the point where they have to have that technology as, you know, an, an appendage to the person that they can't really function without it? Absolutely. Um, I, think, I think in some ways we're, we're already there and it's, it's, going to get, it's going to get worse. For example, um, we, had a, we had a great meeting at, at, at ASU. A couple of people came over from Sandia Labs and we were talking about cognitive enhancement. Everybody's jumping them down and being happy about cognitive enhancement because God knows we could all use it. So, so we get to this point and we're all excited about it. And, and, this vice president from Sandia, who's kind of been a snarly guy all along, and he says, you know, anything you can enhance, I can de-enhance. And the room gets really quiet because we realize he's right. And more than that, just by him saying that, we realize that there probably isn't a major country in this world that isn't trying to figure out how to cognitively de-enhance the people they oppose. Can I do that? You bet I can. How would I do that to the United States? I'd knock out the internet. Not a problem. Depending on who you talk to, our internet is already pretty severely uh, penetrated. Yeah. I mean, I was, I was teaching earlier this semester. First week of class, the uh, school internet got hacked, and they took it down for two days. It was chaos. <laughs> Students had a great time. <laughs> Nothing was happening. What am I supposed to do, Professor? I don't know, it's on Blackboard, which is our, our you know, online resource. Oh, I can't get the Blackboard. <laughs> See you, man. Yeah, absolutely well. And it's going to get worse. If you take a straight line extension, and all of you know that straight line extensions are tricky, so think of this as a scenario. If you take a straight line extension, you remember about a year and a half ago, IBM claimed that they'd, um, equi they'd created the equivalent of a cat's brain in their supercomputer. Big argument from the guys that work on cat's brains, but Mox next. And if you extrapolate that, it takes about 10 years from supercomputer capability to get to an Intel chip. So 10 years from now, my graduates are going to have an iCat hanging off their belt. <laughs> now, it takes about 10 years from the time we did the extension for supercomputing power to cross the rough equivalent of human computational power. So somewhere, around 15 or 20 years from now, I'm going to have the equivalent of a human brain hanging off my belt. And kids like you are going to be totally networked, and you're going to have access, immediate access, to Google. What does that mean? It means we don't have a clue what you're going to look like. <laughs> Seriously. You think you understand this world? This world is completely out of your control. That doesn't mean you can't do things better. But it does mean you've got to start by understanding how little you really know. And we haven't, we haven't begun to do that. Time for one more question. Um, I, all right, two quick questions. One there and one there. <laughs> Our government seems on, to be on a quest. 
Our government is on a quest of selling safety. Social Security, Medicare, safety net, TSA, we're going to make you safe from terrorists. This desire for safety, at what point does it become detrimental and, pro and, pro and prove to be stultifying? I think the way I would, the way I would respond to that is that to the extent we think we're creating safety, we're probably kidding ourselves in the long run. In the short run, you can do a number of different things. But in the long run, the rate of technological change and associated cultural change and economic change is, is going to upend a lot of the assumptions that our programs are based on. So for example, it's fairly clear that there will be a significant extension of life at some point. Could be five years, could be 20 years, it, it's going to happen. There, there's too many people doing too much good work to expect that it's not going to happen. When it does, things like Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, pensions, gone. Who knows what's going to happen to them? How are you going to adjust them? We have very little flexibility because we don't have the money to, to rejigger these programs. And because of that, um, I think safety is going to be a very difficult issue going forward. What may happen is people will get more and more nervous and they'll try to demand more and more safety and we just won't be able to provide it. Existentially, we won't be able to provide it because we won't know what safety means. What does safety mean if you've got a world where you could hit a tipping point in the nitrogen cycle? Who the flip knows? So, one more question, yes. About the evolution of techno war into the future, that you, your first part of your talk, um, you didn't say much about the evolution of the possible opponent. And I think that's interesting. I just want to ask a question about that. I mean, in some sense, we can see that the Russians had already evolved into a people who didn't want to lose too many casualties in Afghanistan. So they were going our way. So it was, it was unfortunate they pulled out of the Cold War when they did. But now, where are we? Because um, we seem to be two classes of opponent. One is the kind of opponent whose capacity for cyber war is as good as the West, and you touched on them. But I'm thinking of the most popular candidates for opponents at the moment, the jihadis, extensions of guerrilla, terrorist war. How does this fit with them? Because they also seem to me to be a military caste. We're not fighting a mass enemy. They're a military caste with some of our technologies, like communication, but quite low quality military technologies. I mean, where does, it seems, it seems to me a lot of robot soldiers aren't going to be a lot of use against them. Well, I think that depends on the situation. I mean, um, you can get into uh, uh, hypotheticals where you're looking at a scenario, for example, where I'm using some of those hummingbirds against specific individuals and I'm enabled to get to them and to target them without civilian damage. So you can, you can play some of those games. But I think the overall challenge is that we don't know how it's going to play out. Uh, we have democratized, there's been a lot of focus in, in American social science about democratizing technology. Uh, well, we've done that to some extent. But what nobody thought about when we were democratizing technology is that includes the white supremacists the, the al Qaeda's, and that some of the technology we're democratizing is not stuff you might want to democratize. Um, I, asked, uh, I asked one of our weirder guys, um, <laughs> we were talking about the 1918 flu virus and the fact that we had replicated it and, and it had been published. And, and so I said this was making me nervous and whether I should worry about it. And he said not to worry about it, there are only about 30 places on the ASU campus he knew of that you could do that. I was not comforted. <laughs> but that's the world we live in. I mean, let's, let's be clear. I've focused on some of the dangers. The world in the future has the potential to be staggeringly beautiful, to be a place that we have only imagined at best in our highest literature. It also poses dangers that we have not begun to dream of. That's really extraordinary. Our kids are going to have opportunities, are going to see things, are going to live in a world of incredible challenge, opportunity. 
beauty, and danger. And that's the way it is. The best I can give them, the best I think any of us can give them, is a clear vision of what their world actually is. And so far, I think we've failed pretty miserably at that. And on that happy Thank note, you. let's <laughs> thank our students.